So far, we've explored a number of very important issues. In my mind, the most important is risk. We've seen many ways to measure risk, and we've seen how these measures are related to average return. In terms of the process of investing, I've argued that you should try to measure risk of a security, examine its expected return, and then based on both, decide how much of that security you want to hold in an optimally formed portfolio. This process has you collect information, analyze it, and then react. If you do not do this for yourself, then you will likely delegate the management of your wealth to a professional manager who will do a similar process. And if you or your professional does not undertake the types of scientific analysis that we've discussed throughout the course, opting instead to react intuitively to the information available in the market, the process still consists of a stimulus and a response. There is a second most important issue, and that is to evaluate if a particular stimulus response process produces any gains relative to a purely passive strategy. As we discussed earlier, one of your options is simply to adopt a purely passive strategy. For such a strategy, you will need to decide on the set of securities you will hold and the amount of wealth you will put into that risky but well-diversified portfolio. Do you want to bear the risk associated with the whole world or simply want to wear, bear the risk associated with blue chip stocks, say in the United States? I suggest that broader is better. While some international securities may be harder to own outright, Increasingly, there are ETFs and index funds that you can hold. To the extent that the various markets around the globe are not correlated with the United States markets, the more markets you hold, the better will be the risk-return trade-off that you have in your overall portfolio. So a global portfolio like the MSCI All Country Index strikes me as a good passive benchmark portfolio. But maybe you should be active too. If your stimulus response process is any good, then it must be the case that you can beat that benchmark. If not, then just do the passive strategy. Now, by the way, if beyond the money that you make or lose, you also get satisfaction out of doing this investment analysis, then your enjoyment should enter into your calculus as well. Although we lose money on many hobbies, we still do them just for the fun of it. And the same should be true for investing. In this lecture, we'll examine the ways in which to evaluate whether an active investing strategy is actually producing anything useful in terms of expected return or risk. That is, the methods discussed in this lecture evaluate the performance of a manager's stimulus response process. We will look at the set of performance measures that are typically used. We will examine how to interpret what they mean. We will also see that you will use different metrics depending upon your specific investment objectives. So context is important. Okay, let's start ask by asking, what is a good benchmark for evaluating the performance of a professional manager? The answer to this question depends upon the context of that manager or fund in your overall portfolio. Let's consider a couple of different situations. Remember Jane and Ichabod? Jane is doing her own investing. For this, she has a portfolio that consists of individual securities as well as a few passive index funds. This portfolio also consists of cash and some investments in short-term risk-free investments like certificates of deposit, money market deposits, and treasury bills. If you exclude these securities and deposits, she has about $2 million in risky stocks, corporate bonds, and index fund. She only has $500,000 in short-term deposits that are essentially default-free. In contrast, consider Ichabod's situation. Ichabod also has about $2 million in risky investments and $500,000 in risk-free deposits. Ichabod, however, has allocated a significant portion of his investments to a couple of actively managed funds. In fact, about a million is evenly split between a global equity fund that invests in equity of mid-cap to large-cap non-US-based companies and a fund that invests in growth firms, those that are fairly early stages of the life cycle and are still expanding operations into new markets. The rest of his million dollars he manages by picking stocks that he thinks could really take off. Both Jane and Ichabod want to evaluate what they've done. So let's consider Jane's problem. 
Jane's problem is very similar to the typical investor's problem we analyzed when we looked at how to form an optimal risky portfolio in lecture 15. Recall that a risky portfolio consisted of just risky securities, such as the passive index fund and the individual securities that Jane holds. The idea of lecture 15 was to form the best risky portfolio where best was defined as that which generated the highest return per unit of risk. Then, given that optimal risky portfolio, the investor could control the amount of risk by deciding how much of their wealth to put into that risky portfolio and how much to keep safe in deposits or risk-free bonds. So in Jane's case, she should pick the portfolio that maximizes the Sharpe ratio. Thus, the appropriate evaluation criterion for Jane's risky portfolio is the Sharpe ratio. She should compare the Sharpe ratio of her portfolio to that of the global benchmark. If the Sharpe ratio of her portfolio is less than that of the benchmark, then she could try to improve her risky portfolio by changing the amount allocated to the two passive funds and the individual stocks that she owns. The material in Lecture 15 should guide her decisions in this regard. But the bottom line is that because the risky portfolio she is forming is the only overall risky portfolio she will hold, she should evaluate the performance of that portfolio and any alternatives according to the Sharpe ratio. If she can't beat the benchmark, she should just invest in the benchmark. Okay, let's next consider Ichabod's case. I will show how the Sharpe ratio is calculated in practice in his case. Let's turn to his case now. Ichabod's situation is a bit more complicated than Jane's because he has a couple of actively managed funds. That is, he has delegated the management of a portion of his portfolio to what are supposed to be actively managed funds. He wants to get an extra boost from active management, but he also wants to be sure he's not overpaying for the extra performance these funds provide. Uh, he also needs to be able to measure their performance. The first question that comes to mind, however, is what would constitute good performance in this case? Should he look at the Sharpe ratio for each fund? These numbers are con commonly provided for fund managers, but is that the right metric in this case? Is what the Sharpe ratio measures really what he wants conceptually? Okay, so let's recall what the Sharpe ratio is. The Sharpe ratio is the expected return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of that portfolio. The Sharpe ratio is an ex-ante measure. That is, at the time the portfolio is being formed, the investors are supposed to pick the weights that maximize the Sharpe ratio. It's an ex-ante measure in the sense that the expected return and the standard deviation are conceptually related to things that the investor expects to hold in the future. For example, the expected return is based upon your notion of the degree of mispricing getting corrected during the holding period horizon. The standard deviation is based upon your forecast of volatility. The Sharpe ratio that are reported in the financial press and on websites are ex-post measures. With these measures, the expected return minus the risk-free rate is the average excess return of that portfolio over some past period of time, say the last five to 10 years. The standard deviation is calculated as the standard deviation of the returns that occurred in the past 10 to 5 years. Thus, if you have 10 years of data on a managed fund, the Sharpe ratio would be calculated based upon the average return of the portfolio in excess of the risk-free return, and the sample standard deviation of those excess returns would be used in the denominator of the Sharpe ratio. Using Sharpe ratios calculated in this way, most investors would rank managers from highest, or best, to lowest, or worst. But note that this measure is backward looking. By looking at this ex post ratio, you are implicitly saying that you think that a manager's past rank will be indicative of that manager's future ranking. That is, if a given fund had a higher Sharpe ratio based upon past returns than another fund, then you might want to pick that one because you think that the rankings are persistent. Uh, this is a pretty big leap. You need to look at the persistence in the Sharpe ratios over time for a particular manager. For a particular manager, look at their Sharpe ratios over many years. Okay, so back to the main issue at hand. 
Is this even the correct measure of what Ichabod cares about? To see if this is the right measure, recall uh, what it measures. It's supposed to be what you want to maximize when you're finding the optimal portfolio of risky securities only. His overall portfolio, which includes both risky investments and risk-free deposits, will have the highest amount of return per unit of risk if the portfolio of risky securities has a large sharp ratio. Once you have such a risky portfolio defined, he can then determine, given the risk of that portfolio, how much he wants to put at risk and how much he wants to keep safe. Thus, there are two overall questions. What is the best risky portfolio and what is the fraction of his wealth that he wants to put at risk in that portfolio? If we were to evaluate each of the managed funds by looking at their sharp ratio, then what would he learn? Well, for each actively managed fund, he would learn how much expected return per unit of risk each portfolio generates if that was the only risky portfolio that he held. Thus, the sharp ratio for a given portfolio is sensible only if that's the only portfolio to be held. If the portfolio you're evaluating is the only risky portfolio you want to hold, then the standard deviation in the sharp ratio is the risk that that investor bears. But if an investor holds two actively managed portfolios, then the standard deviation of the overall portfolio will be some combination of the two individual standard deviations. The real question Ichabod once answered is how much extra return does the actively managed fund contribute to his overall portfolio relative to the extra risk that that actively managed portfolio contributes to his overall portfolio? That is not what the Sharp Ratio tells Ichabod. Note for, that for Jane, since she has only one risky portfolio, the Sharp Ratio does exactly that for her. It tells her exactly what her return is per unit of risk. So what does Ichabod really want? Well, there are a couple of measures out there that will get to what Ichabod really wants to know. One such measure is called the trainer measure. Since the standard deviation of the portfolio's return does not measure risk in a portfolio context, the trainer measure actually replaces the standard deviation by the beta of the portfolio. That is, the trainer measure is the expected return of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by the beta of the portfolio, not the standard deviation of the portfolio. Thus, the trainer measure captures the extra excess return that portfolio provides given the risk of that portfolio as measured by that portfolio's beta. Recall that when we develop the cap M, I argued that the beta of an individual security or an individual portfolio was the incremental contribution of that security to the risk of the portfolio. Thus, the beta of a portfolio Ichabod holds will be the extra amount of risk that that portfolio contributes to his overall risky portfolio. Another measure of the contribution of a managed portfolio to the overall performance of the risky portfolio that adjusts for risk uh, in the managed portfolio is called Jensen's Alpha. Jensen's Alpha is a measure of the extent to which the portfolio's return exceeds what it should be according to, say, Cap M. Specifically, Jensen's Alpha is the average return on the portfolio minus the average of the risk-adjusted expected return. In general, the risk-adjusted expected return is the expected return implied by a particular asset pricing model. If we use Cap M, then the risk-adjusted expected return on the portfolio is the risk-free rate plus the beta of that portfolio times the market return minus the risk-free rate. For any period of the past, you can calculate the risk-adjusted expected return by taking the risk-free rate for that period and adding the beta of the portfolio multiplied by whatever the market return minus the risk-free rate was in that period. Think of the value of this as the, uh, what the value that CAPM implies should happen on average. Then for any given period, the difference between the realized return on the portfolio in that period and this risk-adjusted expected return in that period is the alpha for that period. Jensen's alpha is just the average of the alphas for all the past periods. By the way, if you want to use a different asset pricing model, then each year in the data calculate the expected return implied by that model and subtract that from the realized return on the portfolio being evaluated. 
Think of this as the alpha relative to that particular asset pricing model. Then you just average those to calculate Jensen's alpha for that asset pricing model. Note that Jensen's alpha adjusts for risk by measuring the amount of return that should be paid given its risk. This is important to you because you should not give a manager credit for good performance if all that manager did was load up on risk. It's easy and likely to get high average returns if you just buy very risky securities. What is not easy is finding mispriced securities with real non-zero alphas. Thus, if the return on a portfolio being evaluated is high simply because the risk of that portfolio is high, then Jensen's alpha will be knocked down for that. While Jensen's alpha does adjust the, for the uh, risk in the managed portfolio, the measure does not capture the effect of that portfolio's extra risk uh, on the overall risky portfolio. This is also true of the trainer measure. Although they are similar, you should realize that you may get different answers when you look at portfolios and rank on the basis of the Jensen's alpha versus the trainer measure. To see the relationship between Jensen's alpha and the trainer measure, uh, let's consider a uh, portfolio that has three different uh, characteristics. Let's consider three different portfolios, say, that Ichabod needs to evaluate. Uh, you might also imagine a plot of expected return minus the risk rate for each portfolio against its beta. Let zero denote the origin of this plot. Let one of the portfolios be the benchmark portfolio. Let's call this one M. This portfolio, by definition, has a beta of 1 and has an average return equal to the average return on the market. So M stands for the market. Let's say that the average return on the market in excess of the risk-free rate is 7%. So I can economize on words, right? I'm going to refer to the return in excess of the risk-free rate as the excess return. Thus, the expected excess return on the market is 7%. On a plot, imagine a line emanating uh, from the origin through portfolio M. Let's call this the OM line. This line depicts the relationship between the average excess return and beta as implied by cap M. Since the market has a beta of 1 by definition, the slope of the OM line is the market risk premium, which in this case is 7%. Let the other two portfolios be denoted by X and Y. These two portfolios are portfolios that Ichabod wants to evaluate so they can decide whether he wants to buy or sell them. Let's say that Y has a beta of 0.75 and an expected excess return of 6.25%. X has a beta of 1.1 and has an expected excess return of 8.9%. Also imagine a line from the origin going through point Y. Call this the OY line. And also imagine a line from the origin through point X. Call this the OX line. Now think about moving along the OM line. As we move up and down the OM line, the beta and the excess return rise and fall as implied by cap M. We can use this line as a benchmark. We can pick any beta on the horizontal axis, then read up from that beta to the point that corresponds to that beta on the OM line, then by reading over to the expected excess return on the vertical axis, the value on that axis is the expected excess return implied by the asset pricing model, cap M in this case. For example, for portfolio Y, which has a beta of 0.75, the expected excess return on Y should be its beta times the market risk premium, that is 0.75 times 7%, that's 5.25%. But note that the average excess return on Y is higher than that. It's expected to be, what, six and a quarter percent. The difference between its expected excess return of 6.25% and that predicted by cap M on the OM line of 5.25% is just Jensen's alpha. In this case, it's 1%. Similarly, we can calculate Jensen's alpha for X. In this case, the Jensen's alpha for portfolio X is 1.2%. For a beta of 1.1, the OM line predicts that the excess return on X should be 7.7%. But because the excess return on X is expected to be 8.9%, the alpha is 1.2%. Thus, if Ichabod were to simply pick a managed portfolio based upon Jensen's alpha, 
he would pick Managed Portfolio X because it has a bigger Jensen's Alpha. But is this the right choice? Jensen's Alpha only makes sense if Ichabod is not going to strategically pick the weights in his portfolio. By strategically picking the weights, Ichabod can implicitly lever up a portfolio. So for example, if he borrows by buying on margin, Ichabod can form a portfolio with Y and leverage a portfolio that has the same beta as X. Maybe that levered portfolio will have a larger alpha than X. To see this, consider a portfolio of Y and risk-free borrowing. Let W sub Y be the weight on Y and W sub B be the weight on borrowing. If Ichabod can lever, by say borrowing on margin, then each of the weights need not be less than one. They do have to add to one, but they don't have to be all less than one. We will look at the dollar amounts in a minute after we look at the weights. Recall that the beta of a portfolio, even a portfolio of portfolios, is simply the weighted average of the betas of the individual securities in that portfolio. Thus, what we want are the values of WY and WB, such that WY times the beta of Y plus WB times the beta of B is equal to the beta of X. In this case, if we borrow on margin, then we're borrowing at the risk-free rate, and the beta of borrowing is zero. Thus, we need to solve WY times 0.75 plus WB times zero equals 1.1. That is, WY is going to be equal to 1.47. Then in that case, WB is equal to negative 0.47. That is, if Ichabod has 100,000 of his own money to invest in Y, he uses that but borrows $47,000 on margin to buy $147,000 worth of Y. Let's let the risk-free rate be 2% in this case. What is the expected excess return on this levered portfolio that has exactly the same beta as, as X? The portfolio excess is actually 1.47%. The excess return on this portfolio we just formed, right, has an excess return, in excess of the risk-free rate of 1.47%. That is, this levered portfolio creates a position that has a beta of 1.1 and has an alpha of 1.47%. This levered uh, portfolio alpha is bigger than the one associated with the managed portfolio X, which has an alpha of 1.2%. But when we compare the Jensen's alpha between X and Y, X looked better. This example points out the value of the trainer measure over Jensen's alpha as a measure of performance. The trainer measure is the slope of the line from the origin through the portfolio point. In our example plot, the slope of the OY line is steeper than that of the OX line. So the trainer measure of Y is bigger than that of X. Specifically, the slope of the OY line is what? It's 0 0.062 divided by 0.75 that's equal to 0 0.0833. The slope of the OX line is only what? 0 0.089 divided by 1.1. That's 0 0.0809. It's less. If Ichabod is only going to pick one of these two managed portfolios and not lever up, then he should pick X, not Y. If he does that, he's going to get what? He's going to get an expected excess return of 1.2% rather than 1%. But if Ichabod is going to form a portfolio with one of these managed portfolios and perhaps lever up, he should use Y, not X. He can create for himself an alpha of 1.47% out of Y rather than an alpha of just 1.2% with X. There's another measure that is similar to the trainer measure based upon leverage called the M2 measure after Modigliani and Miller two Nobel Prize winners in economics and finance. Their idea is to consider the amount of volatility in a passive market portfolio and lever up and down the managed portfolio until that position has the same volatility as the market. Once you have that position, you can compare the expected return on that position to that of the market. If the managed position dominates, invest in the managed portfolio. If not, invest in the market. To see how to do this, let's see what would uh, happen if the volatility of the market was, say, 20%. Regardless, regard, remember that such a volatility corresponds to 
uh, 0.2 raised to the second power, which is a variance of 0.04. Also, also, let's say that the managed portfolio is a portfolio Y from earlier. Let's say it has a volatility of 25% or a variance of 0 0.0625. Again, let's form a position with the managed portfolio and borrowing or lending that will match the volatility of the market. That is, let's again pick uh, W sub Y and WB. This time, let's pick them not so that we can match betas, but so that we can match the volatility with that of that in the market. For a given value of WY and WB, in general, the variance of that portfolio is going to be what? The variance of the portfolio is WY squared times the variance of the return on Y plus the weight on uh, the uh, risk-free security squared times the variance of the return on that plus two times the weight on Y times the weight on the uh, risky on the risk-free security times the covariance of the return between Y and the risk-free security. But look, because the borrowing is risk-free, the rate does not vary, and the variance on the risk-free security is zero, and also the covariance between the return on Y and the risk-free security is zero. Thus, the variance of the portfolio Y in borrowing and lending simplifies to simply the weight on Y squared times the variance of the return on Y. So that's going to be the weight on Y squared times 0 0.0625. This implies that the volatility is equal to what? The, the square root of that, the standard deviation, is the weight on Y times 25%. We want to pick the weight on Y such that the volatility is the same as the market's volatility of 20%. So that's what we're going to do is set the weight of WY equal to 20% over 25% or 0.8 or 80%. Thus, if Ichabod took his $100,000 and invested $80,000 in the active fund, that's fund Y, and $20,000 in T-bills, then he would have a position that has, what, 20% volatility. This 20% volatility is the same that he could achieve if he just put his $100,000 into the market. But how does the expected return compare? The expected return on the market is the risk-free rate plus the market risk premium of 7% for a total of 9%. The expected return on the 80-20 portfolio of Y and T-bills is going to be equal to what? It's going to be 80% weight on the return on Y. That's the risk-free rate, 2%, plus its beta, 0.75, times the market risk premium of 7%, plus Y's alpha of 0.01, or 1%. Plus, we're going to take the weight on the risk-free bills, which is 20%, 0.2, multiplied by the return on those risk-free bills of 2%. When we add all that up, what we find is that's equal to 0 0.09. That's 9% too. Thus, even though the managed portfolio Y has a positive Jensen's alpha, if that's the only portfolio that Ichabod is going to hold, then the extra performance in the alpha is going to be eaten up in its extra volatility. This is because the managed portfolio Y is designed to beat the market, not be the market. In order to beat the market, it has to have some non-market weights on some of its various securities. If the active managers of this fund to do that, then they're likely to be less diversified than if they had market weights. In fact, in order to exploit deviations from equilibrium returns, the managers must take extreme positions. Recall that in the lecture on optimal active portfolios, we discussed how the optimal positions necessarily entailed bearing some idiosyncratic volatility. Thus, it is likely that fund Y has greater volatility than the passive market because it does not have a diversified position that takes away all of the idiosyncratic volatility completely. What the M2 measure says is that if Ichabod is going to hold just one active portfolio, he should not hold Y. He should hold the market instead. But why should Ichabod just hold one managed fund? In fact, most managed funds are actively managed knowing that the investors will not hold them as their only risky portfolio. If they know they are going to be held with other active funds in a portfolio of funds, what performance measure do they want to compete on? Each fund will want to be high in demand as a component of an overall optimally formed portfolio of risky securities. So for example, 
At my university, the chief investment officer for the university manages the university's nearly $1 billion portfolio. He's not allowed to take positions in individual securities. He is only allowed to invest in the portfolios managed by others. Thus, rather than pick individual security, he picks managers. How can he evaluate whether a manager is any good or not? This is essentially what Ichabod needs to do as well. Well, given that what he's going to do is decide how to allocate his $1 billion amongst a bunch of different risky portfolios that are actively managed, what he wants to do is look at how each individual's uh, managed portfolio contributes to what? The sharp ratio that he can form out of the portfolio of all these actively managed portfolios. So the university, by the way, only holds this one risky portfolio that he is creating. He's creating this out of a bunch of individual managed portfolios. So what should happen in this case is the university should actually, what, me uh, measure his performance on the basis of the Sharpe ratio, but how should he measure the portfolio performance of all the other people that he's buying actively managed portfolios from? The appropriate metric is called the information ratio. Recall that when we discussed how to form the optimal risky portfolio on the basis of any active analysis, we noted that there was a trade-off between the alpha and the idiosyncratic volatility of active positions in securities or portfolios. The information ratio is the ratio of the alpha to the idiosyncratic volatility. The reason this is the right metric is because of the following mathematical fact from Portfolio Math. The Sharpe measure for a new portfolio squared is equal to the Sharpe measure of a passive portfolio squared plus the, the whole quantity squared of the alpha on the active portfolio divided by the uh, volatility of the idiosyncratic component for that actively managed portfolio. The variable S nu in the, is the Sharpe ratio of the new portfolio that optimally mixes in a position in the active securities into a passive portfolio. What I mean by active securities are the ones that have non-zero alphas. These are the securities that are you either find or a professional manager has spent time researching. These are the ones that appear to be under or overvalued. So S passive is the Sharpe ratio for the passive or the market portfolio in this expression. The last term is the square of the ratio of the active portfolio's alpha to the standard deviations of its idiosyncratic terms. What the above expression says is an active portfolio will contribute to the overall trade-off between return and risk in the overall risky portfolio as measured by the sharp ratio of this new portfolio. Recall that when we discussed the optimal mixture of active and passive positions, we divided the optimal risky portfolio into two parts. A passive part consisting of a broad-based portfolio as a, a, a passively managed portfolio and a portfolio of active investigated securities. By adding in active, uh, an active portfolio, the Sharpe ratio will rise above that that is generated by the purely passive part uh, by itself. The amount the active portfolio adds to the Sharpe ratio of the uh, passive portfolio is related to the alpha on that active portfolio divided by the idiosyncratic volatility of that active portfolio. This ratio is called the information ratio. Thus, an actively managed fund with a high information ratio will increase the overall portfolio's Sharpe ratio significantly. In this lecture, we've seen a number of performance metrics. The Sharpe ratio, the trainer measure, Jensen's alpha, and the M2 measure. And then finally, the information ratio. We've also seen that the measure you need to look at depends upon how you are using that portfolio that you're evaluating. If it is the only portfolio you will hold, use the Sharpe ratio. If you're going to mix that portfolio in with other actively managed portfolios, first identify good candidates with the trainer measure. Then use the information ratio. Since Jensen's alpha is often reported, you also need to be aware of how that measure works as well.